and just greet somebody tonight.
to give the Lord praise offering tonight. Hallelujah. The song says you are holy. Oh, so holy. There's no one like you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh,
God. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. Just lift those hands tonight, church. Nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're a living hope. Your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing like your presence, God.
of God. Praise God. That's what he wants to do. If you need a physical healing, stack that step out. If you need a physical healing, we're going to lay hands on one another. That's biblical. It doesn't matter if this is your church home or not. You're part of the family if you know Jesus Christ. Make a single line so folks can get behind you and pray for you. If you have some other kind of a miracle you need quickly, come and join those that are down here. Maybe financial, maybe family, maybe job, maybe something else. Because believe God. The Bible says you have not because you what? Ask not. Ask not. And Jesus said, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking is what the text says. Amen. You being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give those things that are needful to those that keep on Amen. asking Amen. him. Amen. Now, as many as would, come on, lay hands on these folks tonight. Come on, come on, you don't heal them anyway. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on, maybe you've never done this. Again, it doesn't matter if this is your church home or not. If you believe, the Bible says these signs will follow them that believe. Just feel free to come pray for people. Let's believe God together. This is what we're instructed to do. Hey, we need more folks over here. We need a couple more over here. Come on down. Make sure everybody has hands laid on them tonight. 
I'm going to believe God. Now I'm going to ask you to do something a little different. I'm going to ask you to do something a little different tonight. In the days of Jehoshaphat, when three nations moved against Israel, okay, and in order to attack the enemy, what they did, they set out and they began to praise the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So I want us to sing that chorus one more time, and when we're done, let's lift our voices and praise God. Not just clap our hands. Let's lift our voices and praise the Lord. Let's sing that part one more time, Sister Nicole, maybe twice. Praise God.
God. Praise God. Thank Pastor Nicole and the praise team and the musicians. And I don't know how you could sit down that quick. I'm sorry. <laughs> praise God. Well, God is good. He's pouring his spirit out around the world. He's doing great things. It's exciting what God is doing. How many know someone that's not saved? Come on, let me see your hand. Okay, what'd you do about it this week? Well, you do more than pray. We're messengers. See, a lot of times when we just pray, we're asking God to be our messengers when we're his messengers. So we have to pray and move. That's like the pastor that had the biggest church in China before the communists took over and he couldn't speak very good English. And they asked him, they said, Dr. Lee, what is the secret of your success? He said, me have two secrets. He said, me get on me knees and me talky, talky, talky. He says, then me get on me feet and me walky, walky, walky. And a lot of Christians are all talk and no walk, and some try to walk before they've talked. And we need both. We need both. We need to wait on God, and then we need to get up and go. We need to get up and go. How do you know someone that's a Christian but doesn't go to church? Invite them. Invite them. You know, the book of Hebrews, stop forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as a matter of some is, and that much more as you see the day approaching. And the implication is implied in the next verse, that if you don't, for if we keep on practicing willful sin after we've received the intimate knowledge of the truth, it remains no longer a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation that shall devour the adversary. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God, has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and done despite to the Spirit of grace, it's written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The next verse says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And the implication is if we keep absenting ourselves from the, from the house of God, that's eventually going to happen to us. Because we need the strength that we draw from other people in the presence of God. God made us to need each other. How many notice he didn't give one person all the gifts? Okay? He made us to need each other. And so he didn't create anyone to be an island to themselves. And they can say they can be a good Christian going to church on television. No, they can't. They can be a Christian, but not a good Christian. The Bible's very clear. Stop forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And that much more as you see the day approaching. So invite people. Bring them out Sunday. Believe God for a mighty move of the Spirit. I know God has laid a special message on Pastor George's heart. And he wanted to preach it last Sunday. But if you were here, you know the Holy Spirit took over both services. He didn't get to do that. And so that's, that's what happens here. It's happened the whole 40 years I've been here. God takes over. And he knows a whole lot more what he's doing than we know what we're doing. So he and I, I was always willing to back off and have God do what he wanted to do. And so is Pastor George. Because we just want God to have his way. Our prayer, my prayer was always before service, God, come and show off. Come and show off what only you can do. He's the only one that can change lives. He's the only one that can heal broken hearts. He's the only one that can give physical healing. Now, God uses medicine because all knowledge is God's knowledge. God put it here for people to discover. So God's healing is not contrary to man, God using man to heal. God does it both ways. Sometimes he'll send you to doctor and the doctor will say, I don't know what I'm doing, but here, here, let's try this. And it's you know, still the practice of medicine. Thank God for good medical people. But God still is the ultimate healer. And we're grateful that we've always had doctors that understood that, that God was always the ultimate healer. So we pray and believe God together. If you need a debit envelope to give to God tonight, slip your hands up. The ushers will be happy to give you one. And I'm just really curious tonight. <laughs> yeah. How many of you did your homework? Praise the Lord, I'm going to faint. <laughs> you read the whole book of Ephesians, like I said, and if you didn't get the handout on Ephesians, we'll get the ushers to pass some out if you'll slip your hand up, the one on Ephesians. Uh, that was the one we passed out last week that starts out practice of structural book method of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is just a fancy word of how to interpret the Bible. Uh, when I go to Samoa in November, that's what I'm teaching at master's level to pastors. Uh, hermeneutics. Now it's a lot more complicated than here because we have 45 hours of classroom time. But uh, uh, the homework, why don't you read the book of Ephesians? And I said to read it through rapidly, don't get bogged down in it. So if you pass those out, everyone has their hand up, we'd appreciate it. And we're going to be in the book of Ephesians for a few weeks now. And so we're going to go through it verse by verse now that we've started on it. But I wanted you to see how to do certain things. I got, I got a couple more handouts tonight, but I don't want to hand them out yet. So if you didn't get one of these, again, please slip your hand up. It's got the book of Ephesians attached to it. 
okay, has the book of Ephesians attached to it, the version I wanted you to read. And uh, we can, because I wanted you to read the version you probably hadn't read before, I wanted you to see what it actually says. A lot of people call the book of Ephesians the crowning work of the Apostle Paul. And let me remind you, the Apostle Paul is writing as a theologian. He's not writing as a theologian, he's writing as a pastor. He's correcting problems that exist in the churches that he's helped start in other churches. And I think people make a mistake by trying to think Paul was writing primarily as a theologian. I've heard people make a statement, the book of Romans is the gospel according to Paul. No, it's not. There's a lot, a lot more to the gospel of Paul than the book of Romans. Uh, and so he's writing as a pastor, indicating what he wants us to understand. But I'm not going to forget the offering, so <laughs> because it, uh, again, this church depends on each one being faithful each week. And let God continue to bless you. Now, if you want to help with my trip to Samoa after the service, there'll be a basket back there, brothers, if you can put a basket back there and some offering envelopes. I, I'll be leaving for Samoa on the 7th of November, the Lord willing. And I will leave here on Thursday, and I'll get to Samoa Saturday morning. It's six hours the other side of Hawaii. I'll, I'll get to Samoa Saturday morning. I'll preach on Sunday. I'll teach Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, the master's level course for pastors. I'll preach on, I'll, I'll swim on Saturday. I'll, I'll preach on Sunday, teach Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, till about three o'clock, catch a 5.30 plane on Friday back to Honolulu. And I pass the international date line, so I get there at midnight on Thursday. I leave on Friday, but get there at midnight on Thursday. Have about a six hour layover, then fly from there to San Francisco and San Francisco to Kansas City and get home the same day about 4.30 which will be on a Friday, and so it's, it's always a quick trip when I go. So if you want to help for that particular missionary trip, uh, many of you know I teach for Asia Pacific Seminary in the Philippines. They have extensions all over Asia, uh, Malaysia, Burma, Singapore, Thailand, uh, China, uh, the Philippines, Fiji, Samoa, and, and I do a master's level course. And so if you'd like to help with it, there'll be a basket back there after brothers on the on the side. Father, we're thankful again tonight. We have a privilege of giving back to you a portion of that that's yours. We know that you bless us, that everything we own is yours, and we're managers according to your word in Luke 16. And there's coming an accounting day, and you make it clear in your word that the first tenth belongs to you. That's not even ours to decide what to do with, and we pray about what offerings to give according to 2 Corinthians. So I pray that you'll bless your people abundantly as we offer these gifts out of hearts of love. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 Uh, I passed out some other things, structural relationships from your text and a few more. Uh, how many did not get a copy of this yet? This was about three weeks ago. I, and I think possibly when the ushers are done, we have some more of these back there. And I just want to briefly mention these. Uh, some structural relationships that you find in your Bible. It says from your textbook, while well, the master's level, they use a textbook. And uh, these are some structural relations you find in the Bible, grammatical things. And I'll read the list. If you don't have one, you can get one after. Or maybe the ushers will find some and pass them out. So when it says structural relations from your text and a few more. And we talked about proportion. What proportion of a book of the Bible is given to a particular subject? That's how it shows how important the author considers it to be. For instance, in the book of Genesis, chapter 1 to 11, there's many generations. In chapters 12 to 50, there's only four generations mentioned because God is picking out a people. So you have to, and you also have to look for cause and effect. The resurrection of Lazarus, the effect was the Jews, the religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus because they couldn't deny that Lazarus was raised from the dead. Climax from the least to the greatest, and I've given some illustrations of that. Then comparison, the parables. And the word parable means to be called alongside of. It's a story that's called alongside of a truth to present it. And the Bible also uses similes, which is, which is a comparison using the word as or like. The kingdom of heaven is like such and such. And then there's contrast, light versus darkness. And you find that in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things came into existence through him, and apart from him there came into existence not one thing which has come into existence. In him was light, and that light was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness couldn't put it out. That's John chapter 1. And the whole gospel of John is the darkness trying to put the light out. 
as Jesus makes the various trips back to Jerusalem for the feast days. And the capital city, because of their religion, rejects him. And so you have the contrast of light and darkness. You have the common people versus the religious leaders. who Common people gladly accepted Jesus. Romans chapter 4, you have the contrast of faith versus works. And then you have sometimes what's called pivot. And I just mentioned that on here. And I mentioned the feeding of the 5,000. And the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle in all four Gospels. And, uh, and that's after the opening ministry of Jesus till you get to the last week. Because after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus turned primarily away from the multitudes and spent the last part of his ministry only teaching the 12. On occasion, the multitudes, but primarily the 12. So the feeding of the 5,000 is what we call a crucial pivot point. We have interchange, the alternating of certain elements, and I explain that on the paper. We have generalization to particularization. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, who can quote Genesis 1-1 for me? In the beginning, God, what, created the heavens and the earth. That is the title. That's the general statement. Then the particulars, he tells us how he did it. The earth was shapeless and uninhabitable, and the Spirit of God fluttered on the face of the deep. Now, why does the Hebrew say fluttered? All of our energy is wavelength. Energy is wavelength. Even gravity is wavelength. And the Spirit of God fluttered and put all the energy into this world. The Spirit of God fluttered on the face of the deep. And on day one, and then it shows how God created this earth for man. On day one, he created light. And you notice the sun and the moon don't exist till the fourth day. So how do you know God can create light without the sun and the moon? <laughs> he, he, he dwells in light unapproachable is what the Bible says. Have any of you ever seen the northern lights, the aurora borealis? Well, when I grew up in Michigan, sometimes it looked like the sky was on fire at night. The whole, the whole northern area just lights up like a bunch of flash bulbs going off. And there's no light source. It's chemicals. It's chemical reaction. And then so on day one, he created light. On day four, the light bearers, the sun and the moon. On day two, he created the atmosphere and the sea. On day five, the atmosphere creatures and the sea creatures, the birds and the fish. On day three, he created the dry land. And on day six, he created the land animals. And then the crowning work of creation, man and woman. So turn to the person next to you and say, you're the crowning work of God's creation. Okay. But it starts out with a title telling what happened and then the details of how it takes place. And that takes place frequently in the Bible. Now, sometimes they give the details first and then come up with the title. And so I gave you some examples of that that you can look up. So I hope you're using this paper to look those things up and, uh, and to see what's going on with them. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, we have introductory or preparatory. That's the preaching of John the Baptist. Mark's gospel says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Behold, John came preaching, John the Baptist. Uh, you have prop... Uh, I, I have question and answer, and I've given you verses. Romans 6, 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he answers it. Be it not so. Be it not so. How shall you that are dead to sin keep living into it? Know that you're dead to sin. So on. And then uh, uh, he also has, uh, uh, he has repetition. Well, he has problem and solution. Uh, one of the big problems is 1 Corinthians 8. Is it right to eat meat offered to idols? And I've done an illustration on this before. There was one group said, hey, you can't eat meat that's been sacrificed to an idol. I don't care if it's cheap. You can't eat meat sacrificed to an idol. And the other group said, hey, you're just an immature Christian because we know that God made the meat. So why should I pay $12 for a steak when I can buy one for 50 cents at the idol temple? Because it's been offered to an idol. So they had this big controversy. Well, you're just an immature Christian. No, you're backslidden. You're away from God. You're eating meat offered to idols. So they wrote to the Apostle Paul. And he basically starts out, you can read his argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And what it amounts to is God couldn't care less. <laughs> God couldn't care less. Stop fussing about it. God couldn't care. But if meat's going to cause my brother to stumble, I won't eat it as long as the world stands. So... It's, it's a whole big thing like that. So I give you examples of that. Repetition, Romans 1, 24 to 28, over and over. God gave them over. Uh, in Revelation, seven times, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit's saying to the churches. Uh, we talked about parallelism already when, and when Jesus told Nicodemus, a man must be born of water and the Spirit. We talked about this last week. The ancients knew a baby was born from a bag of waters. And Nicodemus had said, can I enter the second time into my mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, no, you have to be born of water and the Spirit. 
And then he explains it, the next verse, it's called parallelism. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Nicodemus, you can get back in your mama's womb a hundred times, and you're still flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So Jesus himself explained what he meant. Continuity, the use of similar phrases or examples. Uh, it says his hand is stretched out still in the book of Isaiah a number of times. Uh, the book of Hebrews, the heroes and heroines of faith are listed showing a different aspect of faith. In Luke 15, there's a three-part parable. It's all teaching the same truth. And then radiation, a unity that fills every part. The 119th Psalm is all about the Word of God, the longest chapter in the Bible. It's all about the Word of God. And so you have a lot of that, and I've given you illustrations, and an instrument, the seven signs of John. But tonight we're looking at Ephesians. Read the book through once to discover the theme of the book. How many discovered a theme or themes? Okay, now real loud, what theme did you discover? Okay, he uses the word predestined, okay, in chapter 1. Okay, what else? The whole book, what's the theme? Who we are as believers in Christ. Okay, who we are as believers in Christ. Somebody else see a theme. Yes, loud. How believers should treat other believers. What else did you see? Loud. Okay, it talks about love, okay. What else? Yes. Okay. Have you taken this course from me before? Aha. <laughs> you cheated. <laughs> okay. Pardon? I, I said the believer's position and walk in Christ. Okay. Now, let me ask a second question. Did you see, how many major divisions did you see in the book? Don't you answer if you took it before. How many major divisions did you see in the book? How many? Three. Three, okay. You saw two, okay. How many others? Four, no. Okay, four. I mentioned last week, though, when we marked 16 chapters, there's only three major divisions. And this is only six chapters, okay? So did anybody, okay, how many saw two that did the work? How many saw three that did the work? How many saw four that did the work? Okay. Uh, I'll pass you my outline a little later, and I'm convinced there's two. And I'm going to give you a chart on the book. Uh, and that's the major divisions. Now, now, then I had read the book through a third time to determine the segments. That's smaller divisions within the major divisions. And uh, how many segments did you all see? I've never counted them. I've got them here, but I've never counted them. How many segments did you all see? Anybody? Uh, yeah, therefore would be uh, would be a uh, uh, he changes paragraphs just uh, uh, of the words therefore and wherefore. Okay, why don't I pass out my chart? Okay, why don't we go ahead and pass out the chart, brothers? I now, now this is this is what I do with the book of Ephesians, and I thought I had lost this back years ago. I had a course at master's level, 1959, and I was it was how to. It was actually how to teach the Bible. And I turned in some work on Ephesians. And I was asked to teach this in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia here a few years ago. And my wife had thrown all my notes into the fire. And she threw a stack of magazines that had my master's thesis in. It had a bunch of my teaching notes in. And she threw them in the fire by mistake. And I was asked to teach it. So I called my old professor. Uh, he at the time was the... He was the president of Gordon Conwell Seminary. And his name is Bob Cooley. And I said, Bob, have you, do you have an outline on that course I took from you? It was about 40 years after. I said, have you got an outline of that course I took for you? He had just taught it for the first time in 40 years. He not only sent me his outline, he sent my, my original papers back. So this is from some of my original papers on the book of Ephesians. So you should have a chart there on the book of Ephesians where I show you what I do with it.
if I can find my chart here. I know I put one in here. I made copies and put them back there. I might have forgot to give myself a chart. Can I have one of my own charts back, please? Thank you. Okay. You know, this is what I do with the book of Ephesians. And then I'll give you an outline based on this chart, but I didn't want to give you both of them at the same time. Okay, I see the position, unity, and walk of believers in Christ. Okay, I see the position, unity, and walk of believers in Christ. And every time Paul writes a letter to the church, he talks about unity. Why? The church cannot be destroyed from the outside, only from the inside out. And lack of Christian unity is one of the biggest detriments to building the kingdom of God. And uh, this was the problem with the Corinthian church. They were saying, well, we're of Cephas, we're of Paul, we're of Apollos, oh, well, we're of Christ. They had these little factions and they weren't getting along with each other. And the other group was wrong and they were right. We're of Paul, I mean, like the league of liberty you have in Paul. Other groups said we're of Cephas, that's Peter's Hebrew name. And so they were probably the legalistic group. And then there was another group that said we're of Apollos, boy, he can preach, we like the way he preaches. And then there was another group more spiritual, off, we're of Christ. Hey. And by the way, Paul rebukes all four groups, <laughs> all four groups. And the big thing in the Corinthian church is unity in Jesus. And that's why, the, that, that's why that's the only book you have the discussion about the communion service in. That's the only book that has the discussion. Whosoever shall eat and drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is what the, t is what the text says, not unworthily. And because of the division taking place in that church, you read 1 Corinthians 11. And the theme, the body of Christ, starts in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where it says we are the body of Christ and members one of another. And that theme, the body of Christ, runs all the way through chapter 14 of Ephesians. And it's right in the middle of that that Paul talks about the Lord's Supper. Now, how many of you were taught if you're not a Christian, you better not take the communion service? Come on, let me see your hand. Yeah, how many of you were taught if you're not a, boy, if you're not a member of this church, you better not take communion service? God's going to kill you. You're going to drop dead in service. Okay. Yeah, if you take it, it's a sin if you're not a Christian. Yeah, or else it's a time to say, oh God, I've sinned three days ago, so I can't take communion. Where is that in Scripture? 1 Corinthians 11. Now, what is he saying? A text without a context is a pretext. And what is the context? The unity of the body of Christ. And what they were doing, they were having what they called a love feast. We'd call it a potluck dinner. How many ever go to a potluck dinner? And what they would do, they would tack a communion service on the end of it. And read what Paul says before he talks about the Lord's Supper. In taking your food, everyone takes before everyone else, and the poor people are doing without food. And people are even getting drunk. And Paul shares, you're despising the poor. You're not giving them to eat. Read the context. You're despising them. Haven't you got homes to eat in? He says, when you come together, you can't take the Lord's Supper because I'm eating my food and my brother's doing without because he's poor. Then he goes on to say, for I received the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, after he had given thanks, he took bread and break it, said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance is me. After the same manner also, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, you're announcing my return till I come back. You're announcing my death till I return. This do in remembrance of me. And then the King James, unfortunately, says, Whosoever shall eat and drink the cup of the Lord unworthily, as if there's some kind of personal worth. Anybody here good enough to go to heaven on your own? No. No. If you think you are, we'll pray for you. Jesus. All right? Yeah. So we're not. The Greek text says, in an unworthy manner. Unworthy manner. And all the newer translations say that. They don't say unworthily. They say in an unworthy manner. Not discerning the Lord's body. The context of the Lord's body is not that body hanging on the tree. We are the body that he's talking about there. So he says, the way I'm doing in an unworthy manner is, I'm not making sure my brother gets food. 
I'm not making sure that the poor are having as much to eat as those that are rich. Whosoever eats and drinks in an unworthy manner is guilty of the body and blood. Uh, uh, they're actually guilty of the body and blood of Christ. Why? Because we're not taking care of each other. And he says, for this cause, many of you are sick and many of you sleep. And I like David Lim's interpretation of it. He's one of the great scholars in the East, uh, in Singapore. And many of you know David Lim. He's been a college, uh, he's been a seminary president. He, uh, he, wrote the, uh, he wrote the textbook that's used all over, all over the world in seminaries on the Holy Spirit. We've had him here every year for several years. And David Lim says that's why people are sick, because they're not taking care of each other. That's why many of the saints had died. And then he goes on to indicate if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And after saying all that, he says, therefore, when you come together, make sure everybody gets food. That's all he's talking about. He's not saying if you're in, who would Jesus turn away from his table? Nobody. And it takes the place of the Passover. You read the feast of the Passover in the Old Testament, it was for the people of Israel and the strangers within their gates. That's the purpose of the communion service. And the way I always did communion service here, the 33 years I was senior pastor, I would preach and then give an altar call for people to get saved. Then after that, we would have the communion service. And I would tell people, this is the Lord's table. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you're from. As you, I, I want you to take, come to the Lord's table. And as you're eating this bread and drinking this cup, remember that Jesus Christ did this just for you. He poured out his body was broken for you. He poured out his sinless life for you. And as you take communion, receive Jesus Christ as Savior. And after that, and I've already given an altar call. After that, I say, how many received Jesus Christ for the first time in your life? And hands go up all over the church. Because that's the purpose of it, to come to the Lord's table and to fellowship with one another. So it's not a time to beat your breath and say, oh, I might have sinned three weeks ago, so I can't take communion. That's not the context. The context is taking care of each other. Taking care. You all still here? Okay. See, you've known for 40 years I'm a heretic anyway, so... <laughs> That Anybody sure that comes into the church before. can take communion. Anybody that comes in, it's the Lord's table. He doesn't turn people away. He said, come unto me, you that labor under heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. Amen. I've taken my stand at the door, and I'm knocking. If anybody hear my voice can open the door, I'll come in and sup with him, and he with me. And it takes the place of the Passover. Again, the Passover was for the people of Israel and the strangers within their gates. So anyone that comes in these doors is welcome to take communion. Mm -hmm. Well, well, they should. They might get saved taking it. That's the bottom line. Okay. But we follow tradition. Tradition, tradition. Okay, how many of you ladies have attended churches where women were not allowed to speak in church? Okay. That's a terrible tradition too. Terrible tradition. Paul says to Timothy, I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp the authority of the teacher. But read First Timothy. Why is it in the Bible? Paul said, I left you at Ephesus to teach them to stop teaching false doctrine. That's chapter 1 of First Timothy. And if you go to chap Acts chapter 20 at Ephesus, where Paul calls certain elders from Ephesus, and remember, elders are pastors in the New Testament. Elder, bishop, and pastor are the same person in the New Testament. They're not three different people. And that's describing the duties and responsibilities of what they do. And he calls the elders, and he says, from among you, there's going to rise false teachers, from among the elders. So obviously, there were women that had been instructed by some of these elders that were teaching false doctrine in Ephesus. So Paul said, I left you there to charge them to teach no heteros, no different kind of doctrine. And they're usurping Timothy's authority as pastor by taking the leadership in teaching. And so he does not say a woman can't teach, but he says they can't usurp the pastor's authority. If God appoints a woman as pastor, she's not usurping anybody's authority. God has given her that authority. The key word there is usurp. And I remind you that Phoebe, or not Phoebe, uh, Priscilla was the teacher of Apollos. And many of the early church authors, many of the early church fathers thought Priscilla wrote the book of Hebrews. That's why there's no name on it. And the Bible does mention that she was the teacher of Apollos, who was a preacher. So it's not saying women can't teach, but they can't usurp the pastor's authority. They can't do that. Big difference. So we have to leave everything in its context and read what it says. You all still with me now? All right. All right. I didn't mean to get off on that. Yes, sir. 
I try to uh, circle the words that I don't know the definition of. And in chapter four, uh, the word forbearing, I see you got it on your graph too. What does forbearing mean? Forbearing means overlooking what people do to you. Uh, the fruit of the spirit that describes that in Galatians is long suffering. Okay? Long suffering. <laughs> How many times does my brother forgive him and forgive him against me and I forgive him? And the seven times, Jesus? Seventy times seven, Peter. And he didn't mean count 490 times and then pow. Jesus! Yeah, see? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Okay? Fruit of the Spirit. So here's the way I, defy, I divide. You may divide it different. I'm not saying this is right and yours is wrong. I'm just giving you an illustration of how I do this. And now there is a radical change at the end of the third chapter. The end of the third chapter. The first few chapters, there are more power words than any 50 chapters in the Bible. And so you have all this power. Don't forget, when you read the book of Acts, the Ephesian church, there was a big clash between the gospel and the occult. And they burned thousands and thousands of dollars worth of occult books in Ephesus. So there was that clash between the power of darkness and the power of God. And when we get to the end of chapter 1, Paul's prayer, I want you to know the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the effective energizing of the might of his strength, which he effectively energized in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that's named to put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So he has to know the power that's available to you. When you get to chapter 4, 5, and 6, the primary purpose of that power is day by day living for God. So it changes from, you know, the first part is basically theological kind of stuff that gets you shouting. You read the first three chapters of Ephesians, you're getting shouting hallelujah. Look at the eight spiritual blessings. God's going to show us his kindness forever in Jesus Christ. We've been set free by the blood of Christ. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but God, who has done something about it, wow, we, we are great. Then you get to chapter four, now he says, live like it. <laughs> he brings us down to earth and says, live like it for three chapters. So the way I divided up the believers in Christ all the way through the first three chapters from 1.1 to 3.21, and then the believers walk in Christ from 4.1 to 6.20. You have the introduction, 1.1 and 1.2, and then you have the conclusion, 6.21 to 6.23. And so then what I asked you to do was to show the segments, the major divisions, and I find... And I see three major divisions in the first half. First of all, their relationship to Christ, the believers. Secondly, their unity in Christ. And then thirdly, their understanding of Christ. Their understanding of Christ. And then in the second half, you actually have five. Number one, a worthy or united walk. It should be and united walk. A new walk. A loving and lighted walk. A wise walk and a strong walk. So it's walking day by day. Remember the Old Testament. The whole idea of the Psalms was to teach people how to walk. The very first Psalm, happy is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sit in the, uh, walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sit in the, walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, and so on. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Okay? And uh, so, walking, walking, walking. Uh, the Jewish rules of conduct were called Chakadah, which is to walk, okay, to walk. So, uh, the believer's position. Now, 1.3 to 1.14 is the believer's position, and we'll look at that tonight. And then the way Paul breaks it up, there are grammatical clues where the same phrase is used over and over. And our brother here picked it out as he read it. He starts out in 1.15 for this cause, so that shows a change, and it's a different paragraph. Down in the bottom, I told you to give each paragraph a name. And these are the names that I've given to each of the paragraphs in the book of Ephesians. And the handout on the back of the first page, it shows you where the paragraphs are. So, so the first one I called position. Then in the second one, from 115 to 210, I called, there's actually two paragraphs. I called the first one his body and the second one alive. 
And then 211 to 222, this is on the unity. I just used the word one. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father, one God and Father of all. And then apostleship. And the paragraphs are apostleship, apprehend, and power. Apostleship and apprehend of power. And then he goes into the walk. Goes into the walk. And actually, he ends that third part with that great prayer. He's given us all the power words. And then he ends with that great prayer. For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's how he ends chapter 3. I I bow my knee that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I pray you'll have understanding that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I pray you'll be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And then he prays that doxology now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ever ask or think according to his power that effectively energizes in us. What for, Paul? What's the purpose of that power? To cast out demons? Heal the sick? No. To walk united, to walk in love, to walk as light, to walk wise. The primary purpose of the power of God is day by day living for Jesus Christ. And then he tells us how to do it here. Yes, we can cast out demons. Yes, we can lay hands on the sick. But the primary purpose is to let live as a Christian and let people see our light in Jesus Christ. And that's what the whole last three chapters of this is all about. Brings us down to earth, says live like it by the power of God within you. Power of God. So uh, he mentions uh, in chapter 2, then I have the main thoughts here in the middle section. uh, The believer's position, Christ's position, their relationship. And then 2, 1 through 10, the past life which brought us to the present position. And then their unity, unity of Jews and Gentiles in Christ. Uh, their understanding of Christ under that, Paul's knowledge, all men's knowledge, the church's understanding, and all saints' knowledge. A worthy and united walk, lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, okay, and growth. And then a new walk, not as Gentiles, renewed in the Spirit. And he actually says, put off your old man, which is your former manner of living. You're not some kind of a spiritual split personality. Your former manner of living, he defines as the old man. Put away falsehood. Stop lying, he tells them. Put things away. A loving and lighted walk. Be imitators of Christ. Show love. You were darkness, now you are light. A wise walk. Don't be unwise. Don't be foolish. Don't get drunk. He said, don't get drunk where in this riot, but be continuously being filled with the Spirit. And then relationships with your family. If you can't have good relationship with your family, how are you going to have a good relationship with God? Be strong. Finally, the strong walk. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and put on the armor of God. So this will give you uh, just now, the way I do it, you might do it different, but I hope this will help you go, as you go through the book of Ephesians. Now we have an outline based on this. Can we pass those out too, brothers? Okay, we have an outline based on this chart. And, and a lot of people do the outline first. I, I like to do the chart first, but that's Westlake 912. And then I want us to look at the book of Ephesians, just that first part. Book of Ephesians. I got a nice letter from Rod Parsley today. He heard one of my sermons, and so he sent me a really nice letter. (laughs) I'm on the board of his college. uh, I don't have the foggiest idea. I just know Paul didn't. (laughs) Yeah, Paul did not write the book of Hebrews. Now, I know at the top of your Bible, it says the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews. How many have noticed that? But there's several reasons why we know Paul didn't write it. Number one, the author to the book of Hebrews says, we heard the gospel from those that heard it from Christ. Paul in Galatians says, I didn't get it from anybody. I got it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. Secondly, 
Uh, you know, I taught Greek for 25 years. It's not Paul's Greek. It's the closest thing to classical Greek in the New Testament. Uh, and the New Testament, I've told you many times, is written in street Greek. God wanted everybody to understand it. But the book of Hebrews is very close to classical Greek about the time of Homer, 900 BC. And so uh, we know Paul didn't write it just from the internal evidence of what he says, we got the gospel from those that heard it from Christ. And many of the early church fathers thought that, uh, they actually thought it was written by a lady, that's why there was no name on it. That's actually what they thought. Now why does it say the epistle of Paul the apostle? Some of those, when they were forming the canon of the New Testament, remember they had committees and said, does this belong in the Bible? Does this doesn't belong in the Bible? And don't ask me what happened to the lost books of the Bible. God doesn't lose things, all right? There are no lost books of the Bible. God has, how many believe God can give us to say what he wants it to say? Okay? And so he did. He not used people to do it, but he used people to write. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So he moved on people to write what he wanted said. But uh, we don't know who wrote it, but why does it say the epistle of Paul the apostle? Some of the, uh, some of the bishops and things were questioning because there was no name on it. So in order to protect it, a man by the name of Clement of Alexandria, who was highly esteemed, listed it under the epistles of Paul to protect it. The epistles of Paul, if you read his writings, are as follows, and he includes Hebrews, but you read his writing on Hebrews, he knows Paul didn't write it. But he did that to protect it from the critics. He did that to protect it. A man by the name of Clement of Alexandria. But, are they all apocryphal books? The book of Thomas was from about 450 AD, and it was written by Gnostics. And, uh, and then like the apocryphal book of Enoch. Now, we don't have anything from before the flood. There wasn't any book that Enoch wrote. It's an apocryphal book. There were a lot of phony books written with Christian names on them. And the gospel, there's a gospel according to Barnabas. Barnabas didn't write a gospel. It came out centuries later. And so people say, well, you got to take these. No, you don't have to take those. Because the Bible, the New Testament was finished before they were ever written. And a lot of the teachers you see on television are interpreting part of the Bible by the book of Enoch, which is an apocryphal book. You don't interpret the Bible by other books. You interpret the other books by the Bible. This is the test. This is the cue. Does it fit this or does it not fit this? The God that can create a billion times a billion times a billion worlds is big enough to give us a book to say exactly what he wants us to say. And there's plenty of evidence. If you read some of Lee Strobel's materials, and uh, why we know this is the Word of God. Uh, there's a book, More Than Just a Carpenter, by Josh McDowell. I've given that to a lot of college students. I've already been mentioning Lee Strobel's new book, The Case for a Creator, where he takes all the so-called scientific evidence that convinced him to be an atheist and an evolutionist and show why it's all scientifically inaccurate. And that's why I recommend it for college students and high school students uh, to give to their professors. And my grandson gave one to his professor. <laughs> because <laughs> he was teaching evolution. <laughs> Dared him to read it. I dare you to read this, because he talked to the top scientists in the world, and every one of them, without exception, say this could not have happened by natural selection. There must be a designer. And I think I've already mentioned, the leading evolutionist at Harvard University has said evolution is impossible, but the alternative is unacceptable. So he now says that people came from another universe somewhere and, and established the Earth. Where's the other universe? They say, we believe in the Big Bang. Who banged it? We believe in the Big Bang. Who banged it? You know, one of the axioms of science, anything that exists has to have a source, has to have a beginning. And so, you know, anything to keep from believing the Word of God and the beginning God. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, And there's some very important things in Ephesians chapter 1. And when we get done with Ephesians, we'll take uh, uh, just a few weeks on the book of Jonah, and I'll let you try to build a chart. Okay? I'll give you instructions again. Ephesians chapter 1. What have I got? Oh, boy. <laughs> Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. By the way, an apostle is one sent with a commission. By the will of God, that's the only apostle that counts. And to the saints... Turn to the person. Now, the word saint is the Greek word holy ones. 
Okay, the Greek, Greek word holy is hagios. Say hagios. hagios. Saints is hagioi. Say hagioi. hagios. Okay, that's plural. God calls every Christian a saint. So turn to the person next to you and say good evening, saint. Good evening, good evening, saint. Okay, now say good evening, holy person. Yeah, that's the meaning of the word saint. You say, well, I don't think you're very holy. It's not your sight that counts. It's his. Jesus. It's his. Yes. Amen. He, he declares you not guilty of ever having sinned when you receive Jesus Christ. That's what the word justified means. He doesn't say you're a rotten sinner, but I'm letting you off. He says you're not guilty. You're not guilty. The saints in which are faith, in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Celebrate with praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Now you've got to notice from verse 3 to verse 14 is one single sentence in the Greek text. A single sentence. Now they break it up in English. But he gives us spiritual blessings for those that are in Christ. And the thing you notice first is how often he says, in him, in whom. Because this is the key to everything. God has chosen, elected, predestined those that are in Christ. We have the choice whether we're in Christ. And that's the issue. We have the choice whether we're in Christ. The last message of the Bible. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that hears say, come. Let him that's thirsty come, and whosoever will. Whosoever will exercise his or her will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. So the key phrase in this long sentence is in Christ. So let's read what we have because we are in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. According as he has chosen us, it's the same Greek word translated elected. You are elected, chosen, and predestined if you're in Christ. All right? Because he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. We're chosen in Christ. God has chosen those that are in Christ. God has elected. God has predestined those that are in Christ. Now, what's he predestined us to? What's he chosen us to? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, are, are, any, of us, are any of us without blame to ourselves? No. But before him, before him, we're without blame. Uh, the book of Colossians says that he will present us holy and unblameable. And I translate the next phrase, unnitpickable in his sight. If we continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. That's Colossians chapter 1. Chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Chosen us to what? That we should be holy that we should be without blame before him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children. So those that are in Christ are predestined to be adopted as children of God, to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood. You know what the primary meaning of the word redemption is in the Bible? To buy back from slavery. To buy back from slavery. Okay. Redemption through his blood. What includes what? The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Okay. Now, remember, we're saved by grace. We're not saved by anything we do but grace, but we have to receive it. God does not count faith as a work. You read Romans chapter 4. Abraham believed God. God put it down to his account for righteousness, but he does not count that belief as a work. Because it says Abraham was not justified by works. So belief is not considered a work by God when you read Romans chapter 4. A work is a religious credential. Paul says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. Oh, I kept every dot and every I, crossed every T of my religion. I was saved and I was baptized at Sheffield Family Life Center. I attended their discipleship classes. Woo! Look at me. That's why I'm so spiritual. You know what Paul says about that, about his religious credentials? He says, I threw them all to the dogs. 
And I don't forget, Paul's one of the greatest scholars in the history of the world. And he's trying to compare his religious credentials with now the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he starts a sentence, but therefore indeed at least even. That doesn't make sense in any language in the history of the world. The King James translates it, yea, therefore. But, therefore, in why? Paul is so excited about the difference, he can't describe it. I was religious, but, therefore, indeed, at least, even. In other words, wow. That's the difference when you know Jesus Christ. Okay, okay. okay that's Ephesians. Chapter 3. According, he has made us in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We're saved by grace. Wherein he has overflowed us toward all wisdom and understanding, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the administration of the fullness of times, fullness of times. Now, mystery in the Bible is something that's been hidden, but is now revealed. If you read the last few verses of Romans if you read the last few verses of Romans chapter 16, it'll explain the word mystery for you in the Bible. Okay? And may known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the administration of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ. And the mean, word means to put everything in its proper place in relationship to Jesus Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him, in whom we have obtained an inheritance. Being predestinated. Now, what are we predestinated to? According to the purpose of him that works all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So those that are in Christ are predestined to be adopted. Those that are in Christ can understand God's purpose. Those that are in Christ will have the mystery explained to them. Those that are in Christ will be to the praise of his glory because we first trusted in Christ. Those who are in Christ have obtained an inheritance. And actually, it's a passive word. Those that are in Christ have been inherited. Now, for our English teachers, what does it mean, I have been inherited? It means I'm somebody's inheritance. You are God's inheritance. You are God's inheritance. And the Old Testament uses the Hebrew word segula. And he tells the children of Israel, if you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my segula. It's translated, my peculiar people. In the book of Malachi, it says they will be mine in that day when I make up my jewels. The Hebrew word translated jewels is segula, God's particular treasure. So you are God's inheritance. You're all God wants. He can have anything he wants, but he wants you. Just imagine that. Look in the mirror and think, he wants me? Yeah. Now, some of you ladies might smile, not me. Why me, Lord? <laughs> uh, God wants you. You're his inheritance. Uh, that, when, when I was reading that in the Greek text for the first time, I thought, that's passive. Why, why do they ignore that? We have been inherited. So you're a God that can have a billion times, a billion times, a billion angels, and a billion times, a billion times, a billion, whatever he wants, wants you. He say he wants me. Don't let the devil lie to you and forget that. Don't forget that. In whom you also trusted. That's a good definition of faith. After you heard the word of truth. The gospel is true. It's the word of truth. Which is the good news of your salvation. After you believed. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Which is the earnest. In the modern Greek word Arabona translated English. I, I'm sorry, translated earnest means engagement ring in modern Greek. The earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession or the praise of his glory. In other words, you got the down payment of heaven, you got the engagement ring on, there's going to be a wedding one of these days. And the Bible in Romans 8 says we are heirs, joint heirs with Christ. What does Jesus own? Everything, and you're his heir. You're joint heirs with him, so what do you own? Everything. Everything. So don't worry about not having anything here. <laughs> this is temporary. That's permanent. Now, we like to have stuff here, don't we? <laughs> that, that's part of being human. Yes, ma'am. I better get the mic. Yes, be angry and don't sin. I, I have a 
have anger sometimes. So. Well, it's not a sin to be angry. Jesus got angry, but he didn't sin, never lost control. Losing control is what the, is actually the word translated wrath in Galatians. Works of the flesh are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, drugging, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murder, drunkenness, and partying. They which are practicing these things, not that you might not do it occasionally, but those that are practicing these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And you can't say, well, I've got a bad temper. That's the way I am. Well, he came to change the way we am. All right? So temper is a work of the flesh. Wrath. Orge. It's a work of the flesh. So, so you, you're going to get angry, but you don't lose control. So what, how far is control? I mean, what, where do you draw the line? <laughs> or else if you're... Okay, I was in the parking lot today at Price Chopper out in Lee's Summit. And there was an elderly man backed out and another guy was backing out at the same time the other way. The other guy got out and screamed the worst profanity at him and said, why don't you get out of the car and let me kick the so-and-so and so-and-so out of you? Just sit out in the parking lot screaming. That's not having control. <laughs> if you're tempted to get out and scream, say, please, can you move your car back in so I can get out? Yeah, how many of you wanted to let somebody have it recently? <laughs> okay. You don't. You don't. Paul says in Galatians, because you're in the Spirit, you can't do the things you want to. Now, Romans 8 says, if Christ is in you, you're in the Spirit. Do you always act in the Spirit? Not me. Do you always feel in the Spirit? Not me. But Paul, the Bible says in Romans 8, you are in the Spirit if Christ lives in you. Okay. Loud. Where is it found that oh, what you were saying about the lasciviousness and idolatry and all that? Hey, uh, it's in Galatians 5. It's in Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Yeah, Galatians 5. And by the way, the word translated sorcery is the Greek word pharmakia, drugging. Drugging is a work of the flesh. Pharmakia. So we get our word pharmacy from. And where it says, uh, the King James says temperance. Oh, that means you lie a little and you steal a little and you get angry. No, 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 no. No, the Greek word means self-control. Self-control. How do we control ourselves? By the power of the Holy Spirit. But we have to agree with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't make us robots. How many have noticed you still have a free will? Right. We still have a choice. He doesn't make us robots. That's why Paul says that, He's writing to Christians in Romans 6, stop yielding your members as instruments of sin. Stop doing these things. So literally, stop it. Stop. That's why Paul says in Ephesians and, and Colossians, we'll say, put off your former manner of life. Put it off like a coat. Put on the new man. You have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. He's not going to make you do anything. It seems like you get one sin under control and then something else comes up. Welcome to the human race. <laughs> Welcome to the human race. <laughs> God's never finished with us yet. You see, when we're first saved, it's the big stuff drops off. But then he starts dealing with attitudes. How do we treat other people? That's the biggie. How do we treat other people? And uh, huh? the enemy's pretty tricky. And you know one of the major sins that James talks about is respect of persons? Have not the faith of our... Uh, and that was the first word made up by Christians. That word did not exist of Christianity. The word translated respect of persons didn't exist in the Roman Empire, in ancient Greek. But respect of persons. James says, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glory with respect of persons. And he, he goes on to indicate, and the illustration I use, if a man drives up out here in a Rolls Royce, and he has a chauffeur-driven Rolls Royce, and he has a, a, a Rolex watch full of diamonds and a Brioni suit on, and all these expensive kinds of things, and I say, her, sir, you sit right here in front. And there comes in a man with ugly clothes and a street person say, you sit back there. James says you're respective persons and you're guilty of sin. Guilty of sin. And so you can't treat people different. Can't treat people any different. Notice Pastor George doesn't treat anybody different. And my son made the statement here from this pulpit. He said every other staff I've been on, he's been on the staff of several large churches. He said, every other church staff I've been on, if someone wealthy came in, the pastor wined them and dined them. And he said, my dad has never done that one time. 
And remember, I, I grew up in a broken home on the east side of Detroit. My dad left home when I was a teenager. And when I came to the city 40 years ago, all my friends said, get the church out of the city. I said, why? They said, suburban people won't drive in. I said, it didn't know only suburban people were important to God. And uh, we can't treat anybody different because of a different educational level. We can't treat anybody different because they're a different race. We can't treat anyone any, uh, any different because they're other economic level. The ground is level at Calvary, folks. At, the, at Calvary, the, in the kingdom of God, there's no big I's and little U's. All right? We're all, the ground is level at Calvary, and we always need to remember that. So you can't treat anybody any different. The Bible says, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you what? Love one another. In his great high priestly prayer, in John chapter 17, he says, this is how the world's going to know that God sent me, is if you love each other. He says it twice in John 17. That's, his, that's the only lengthy prayer of Jesus we have in the Bible. And he prayed it after he had the Last Supper on the way down to the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where he prayed that prayer in John 17. And the primary purpose was, Father, the glory that you've given me, I have given to them, that they may be one and love each other, as you love me, that the world might know that you sent me. And I don't care what people say about us, that it always be said of Sheffield that everyone is welcome here and we love whoever walks in the door. That has always been, this church has never been a social club, it's a hospital for hurting people. Let's pray it'll always be that way till the Lord comes. Because God wants everybody saved. God wants everybody saved. Praise God for His grace. I'm out of time. I'm out of time. Read the book of Ephesians this week again. We'll be talking about it verse by verse. If you have questions, we'll talk about it. And I could spend a year on Ephesians. I won't. I won't. We'll go through it a little rapidly. Like I could have spent a month just on what we've already talked about tonight. But... And again, write down any question you have. And please be reading the book of Ephesians. Read it rapidly. You don't have to read it real slow. Read it rapidly, then go back and read it slow. Remember, the first half is basically who we are in Jesus Christ. The last half is, hey, what, how are we supposed to live? How do we apply what we know in Jesus Christ? And he gives us the ability to do it. He gives you the ability to do what you can't do without him. If you could do it without him, you wouldn't need him. And when I preach to pastors, I ask, what are you doing that you couldn't do if God didn't perform a miracle for you? Then you're not doing everything God wants you to do. What are you doing that you can't do without God's help? Then he wants you to do more. Father, we're thankful again for your love and your amazing, amazing grace. Father, I feel so heavy tonight for our brothers and sisters in Muslim countries that are being killed, even as we're here tonight worshiping you. I know that even... Even where there's civil war going on, the both sides are using it as an opportunity to murder Christians. We know about the pastors that have been murdered lately in different parts of the world. We know about Mali and Africa where they have a bounty on, bring me a Christian pastor dead or alive and we'll make you rich. So I pray for those that are struggling. I pray that you'll protect them, surround them with your love. In Jesus' name, let their testimony touch hearts and lives. We know we haven't got long to labor. We know that he's coming. We don't know when. But we're to live as men and women expecting our Lord. So I pray that you'll help us to look around with those that we know. To those Christians that are not attending church that need to be strengthened by coming together with their brothers and sisters in Christ. For those we know that don't know Jesus Christ because you're not willing that one soul should perish. Your word says that twice in the New Testament. That you want everyone saved. And you have no messengers but us. So I pray that you'll lay families in our hearts to invite to come to the house of God that they might receive Jesus Christ as Savior. Use your people as we invite others to come. Father, I pray for an assembly I have in mind that's having difficulty right now, another church. Pray that you'll pour your spirit out on that church, that you'll give them the kind of blessing that they need to give strength and encouragement and build that congregation by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray tonight for those that may be here and don't know your son. As every head is bowed and every eye closed, do you know Jesus? I'm not asking if you want to join this church. We're not the way to heaven. But Jesus is the only way. The Bible says as many as received him, he gives power to become the children of God. The Bible says he that has the son has life and he that doesn't have the son does not have life. And the Bible teaches clearly if Jesus Christ is living in your heart, you know it. It's not something you hope so or think so or suppose so. 
Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, I'm not sure. If I died right now, I'm not sure where I'd spend eternity. I need Jesus Christ in my life. I want to know him personally. Pray for me. Just lift your hands up and down. Up and down. Always give opportunity. Always give opportunity. Anywhere in the world where I preach. Always give opportunity. Father, I pray that you will use your people for your glory. Pray that you'll pour your spirit out in a mighty way in the Lord's day in both morning services. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand for his grace. And don't forget our Bible classes on Sunday. We have some at 9, some at 11. The early service is at 9. The second service is at 11. And uh, praise God. <laughs> Read Ephesians. <laughs> and if you want to help on my mission trip, can you put a basket out back there, brothers, please? Can you put a basket out for my mission trip?